So, Kate, not only I lost my bet with you about the reopening of uh, restaurants in New York, I lost it by a huge amount because it seems that we're going the opposite direction. They were about to open, and now they announced they're not going to open. And uh, it seems that the country is moving the opposite direction. Yeah, I mean, the number of cases that we're seeing is uh, reaching a new high. And, you know, the California governor even is ordering everything shut down. And if the news are not bad enough, Kate is leaving us. Um, Yes, it's true. Uh, This breaks my heart to say, but I resigned from Georgetown. So it's not just the podcast that I'm leaving. Um, But next year, I'm going to be starting as a first year law student at Columbia Law. And, you know, this is a decision that I've been pondering for probably the better part of the last decade and finally decided that it was now or never. And if I really want to get everything out of my first year of law school, I think I need to commit fully to it. I fully appreciate that, but it is with great sadness that I have to let you go. Uh, The fact you resigned from Georgetown is not a big consolation to me. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, um, the fact that I'm leaving capitalism isn't, isn't a consolation to them either. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, I think is is a huge loss, and uh, we are gonna find out a, a new solution to to move forward. Uh, but it would be difficult without you. Thank you, Luigi. Now, as a departing present, I'm gonna dedicate the last two episodes to things that you are very dear to you. And okay. uh, two things. Number one, private equity and to what extent is good or bad and minority representation in the economic profession. Since you are leaving the profession, I want to give you this gift. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say the only thing you should add to that list is bankruptcy, but we just did an episode on bankruptcy. So you're you know, checking all the boxes. Exactly. So today we're going to talk about private equity, but with a particular twist to it, there is a big debate about whether private equity adds value or simply extract values. And of course, not all private equity is created equal, but there are a lot of examples of the good cases. Why? Because everybody's very eager to write cases in which the private equity adds value, and this is fantastic. Uh, There are fewer examples of what we call rent extraction. Yeah, and one of the reasons that it's harder in the economics literature to document the downside of private equity rather than the upside is that, you know, when there's upside, everyone shares in that and the private equity firms share the data, you know, the portfolio companies share the data and it's easy to study. But when private equity firms are extractive, then nobody's willing to share the data and we can't study it. In this episode, we want to present you an example in which a couple of private equity funds were able to make close to a billion dollar, just being the right time in the right place, adding no value whatsoever. Well, I mean, they were in the right place at the right time, and they also had the help of some famous economists. We want to be very clear before we start the episode, we're not saying that it was anything illegal going on. In fact, to some extent, this is the problem, because if making a billion dollar without adding value was illegal, it would be easy to stop it just to enforce the law. The fact is, it's not illegal, and the question is, how do we stop it? So on today's episode, we're going to be talking about a case that involves private equity firms exploiting information about the government coming in and instituting an auction that some other market participants didn't have yet. You know, that information was public, but they didn't know it. And so money that maybe should have gone into the coffers of the treasury ended up partially going into the coffers of the private equity funds. And this is really a case of capitalism and one that strikes very close to home. This is Luigi Zingales from the University of Chicago. And recently from Georgetown University, this is Kate Waldock. Actually, I should say from Columbia University, this is Kate Waldock. You're listening to Capitalism, a podcast about what's working in capitalism today. And most importantly, what isn't. So let's start with this idea of the spectrum auction. Now, first of all, I think most people know that in order to transmit data, to transmit radio signals, you need to have access to the spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum. Thank you. (laughs) I mean, not to be confused with the spectrum company. (laughs) That's true. Actually, in the old days, the spectrum was allocated by the FCC based on what uh, used to be called a beauty context. So different people made a 
an argument to use the spectrum and the FCC were deciding who got the spectrum or not. And then there was a Nobel idea. Uh, like Nobel or Nobel? That's a good question because for the way I pronounce it, nobody would be able to tell. But in fact, it's both. It's both. It was a Nobel and a Nobel worth idea actually selling the frequency, selling the spectrum. This was Ronald Coase that actually... I recently discovered, developed an idea of a student at the University of Chicago who made this proposal kind of out of fun. The idea that goes under the name of Coase Theorem is that if you allow people to trade a right that is well-defined, the final allocation of this right would be efficient no matter what is the initial distribution. So New Zealand was the first country to apply this idea in practice, and that was in 1989. And the United States joined in 1994, and since then, hundreds of auctions have been run, raising close to $100 billion for the U.S. government. So, so far, so good, right? This is a fantastic application of an economic idea to the policy practice that led to more efficient allocation and more money from the government. You can hardly find a success story like this. Until we get to something called the incentive auction, which took place in 2016, the government had decided some of the spectrum was allocated towards broadcast TV. But, you know, not all of that spectrum was being used in the right ways. It was being used by people running like reruns of Roseanne and stuff. And there were other companies that could put this to better use. What is Roseanne? You don't know. It's like an old TV show. <laughs> that, that's exactly the point. TV is disappearing, so that I don't even know the old TV show. So honestly, less than 10% of the population is actually using broadcast. More and more people are using smartphones. More and more people are using tablets. They need a huge amount of spectrum for all this data to be delivered timely and effectively. Right. So the idea behind this incentive auction was to take that broadband or purchase the broadband from the TV broadcasting companies that weren't really making good use of it and then sell it back or auction it back to the telecom companies that would make better use of it. Now, the problem, as you can imagine, is how do you go about doing that? Just to make the thing very simple, imagine that some people have a license to farm a piece of government land. And then you realize that there might be oil underneath that land. You don't want the people who have the concession of that land to also exploit the oil uh, opportunity and become rich basically at the expense of the taxpayers because the final owner of that land are the taxpayers. So what you want is to reclaim that, that land, pay out a fair amount to the people who have the license and they might have incurred cost to organize this, and then start drilling and get the oil out. Uh, now, maybe I use the wrong example because these days nobody wants to do it for oil. But anyway, you got the point. Uh, also, I think that if you if you have land and you happen to have oil underneath it, I think that you're like you're allowed to drill the oil, right? If you own the land, not if you have a concession to farm oh, okay. on okay. federal that's property. Fair. And that's the reason I why see. I use this, because the spectrum, you don't own the spectrum. You have a license for a particular use of the spectrum. Okay, that's right. very important. So they, these guys were granted that right to do broadcasting. They were not granted the right to do data transmission, which is a completely different activity with extremely different payoff. Now, you could have the government say, you, you, and you sell the right. I set the price, and then we auction those rights. But the government does not know what is the most efficient allocation of resources. So the clever component of this double auction is, again, to use the cause idea by first selling and then, buy, and then auction it off. You ensure that the people with the lowest value for the use of that spectrum will sell first. There are two objectives here. Number one, you obtain an efficient allocation because the one with the lowest value are the ones who sell. Number two, you avoid potential litigation because the eminent domain route is always challenging court and this can take time. And so there was a, a, quite some urgency in the industry by saying, after all, we need to have 
uh, more spectrum. And so that seemed a very appealing strategy. Right. So just to be clear, on the first side of this auction, you got a bunch of television broadcasters. Now, Luigi's right. They don't technically own them, but they own a license to use them for, say, 15 years, and they might not really want to use them for 15 years anymore. So the government's holding an auction to purchase some component of the spectrum back, and whoever's willing to sell at the lowest price. Like, for example, there were some colleges who owned part of the spectrum, you know, just in case they wanted to transmit their class information, which actually now I think would be useful for them. But it was being used by, like, college radio stations and stuff, not put to the best use. And so there were some of these low-cost or, you know, low-benefit operators that were willing to sell back the spectrum to the government. The auction was divided into two. The second stage is a normal auction in which you have certain number of uh, spectrums in, in different cities, and you sell that spectrum to the highest bidder. And uh, the other bidder were basically use of data transmitter and so on and so forth. Yeah, so like AT&T and Sprint and T-Mobile would be potential purchasers. Maybe they weren't the exact purchasers, but those types of companies. Exactly. While uh, the first stage, this is called the reverse auction, you are buying those rights from whoever used to own them. And there is this uh, bunch of students at uh, Towson University. They got granted this right many, many years ago. They end up selling for a million, uh, uh, 1.8 million, and they were very happy. But, but this is an important point. These guys did not sell in the auction. They ended up selling to a private equity firm. And this is the interesting part. In between the time the FCC released the National Broadcasting Plan, which is March 2010, and the time in which Congress finally approved the law that authorizes the FCC to create a double auction, three private equity firms start to enter big time and buy those licenses market after market after market. Locus Point, that is controlled by Blackstone, NRJ, that is controlled by Fortress, and OTA, that is controlled by MSD Capital, which is basically the Michael Dell private equity fund. Particularly NRJ and OTA, they bought one fifteen license, the other 23. NRJ made roughly half a billion when they eventually they sell in the reverse auction, and OTA made only 400 million. So between the two of them, they make almost a billion dollar. And what value do they add? You know, I'm not a spectrum telecom expert, but my guess would be that they weren't adding much value here. If you think about it, the way that this auction should work well, you know, if it goes as planned, is that the TV broadcasters sell their spectrum rights to the government, and then the government sells them later on to the telecom companies. What was actually happening was that the broadcasters were selling their rights to private equity firms. Private equity firms were selling those rights to the government, and then the government was then selling them to telecom companies. And so they, they were kind of inserting themselves in this intermediate phase and capturing those rents for, you know, essentially just holding on to a defunct TV station for a couple of years. When they bought those licenses, it was not clear that the government would have allowed a double auction, in particular would not allow the reverse auction, by the time they start to sell them out, this has become the letter of the law. In the between what they do, they lobby. Thanks to OpenSecrets.org, we're able to establish that Blackstone, Fortress, and Dell, they all spend money lobbying for what is called the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012. Now, if you wonder what this has to do with uh, the reverse auction, the reverse auction was stuck in this, this bill. This bill was about something else. With this law of the land, every order of the initial licenses was pretty secure in its right. And before, there was some uncertainty because the FCC could have taken those licenses and just reimbursed the license holder for the expense that they had, which would not have been great. These guys saw the opportunity to lobby the government and secure a right, and they took full advantage of it. 
you can imagine it being a little bit difficult if you have a situation in which OTA purchased a couple television stations in the middle of 2011, right? This is before Congress approved the incentive auction in 2012, and then the incentive auction didn't take place until a couple years later. And so if you're looking back, if you're, let's say, like the SEC or something, and you're trying to find evidence of wrongdoing on the part of a private equity firm, you know, they held on to this TV station for almost five, six years. And so can you really pinpoint that specific strategy? It's easy for them to argue that they just wanted to purchase some TV stations and operate the TV stations. Actually, to be honest, they sold all the licenses afterward. So it was pretty clear that was an arbitrary situation. What is more problematic is there is a paper that documents that not only they play this strategy, but also they use their market power to push up the prices at which those licenses are bought back. If in this process of reverse auction, I withdraw strategically some licenses in some markets, I inevitably lead to a higher valuation of those licenses. And so I end up forcing the government to pay more for the license than they should. How do we know, or how do the research of this paper know that uh, they did it strategically? Because they look and they say they did not sell some of those rights in the auction, but they sold it immediately afterward at uh, a lower price. So really, if you had a purpose to keep those, those uh, licenses, you would not have sold them at a lower price immediately afterward. Yeah, I'm trying to come up with like a good example. So it's not really like monopolistic pricing because you know, they're not the only holders of this auction. But it's, there's a similar spirit in the sense that you know, if you restrict the supply, then the prices will go up. Actually, it's very similar to what is called in jargon a short squeeze. So when, when people sell short commodities or, or even shares, if you buy too much of the quantity, you are basically have market power that blocks the ability of the people that lend you the shares to buy them back at a, a market price because you set the price. You have all the, the supply, you set the price. And so you force the short seller into a gigantic squeeze that sends the price to the roof. My understanding of the commodity market, this is illegal. Now, I don't know the rules in this market. I don't know what, I, I suspect because they're not being prosecuted that this was legal. But I think the idea is the same, that you use market power to obtain a higher price. The issue at hand here is that you have television broadcasting companies and just organizations, right? Some of them are like student groups and some of them are just local broadcasters playing reruns of Roseanne. They're not experts in knowing the law. Right? They're not like reading FCC regulations every day. And so they didn't really notice in 2010 and 2011 when these issues first became talked about. Whereas a private equity firm or a hedge fund, right, that's part of their specialty. Maybe that's not their entire specialty, but part of their job is to understand what's going on with regulation and to exploit opportunities where they exist. And so if some of those initial TV broadcasting companies had known that the law was going to change. Uh, you know, the Wall Street Journal a few years ago did a piece on this, and they interviewed some of those initial TV broadcasting companies. And some of them said, look, if I had known that I could sell back to the government at a much higher price, I would have held on to my TV station. But I just didn't have that information. And so what these private equity companies were essentially trying to exploit was their superior information and understanding of regulation over the knowledge of these TV broadcasters. And to be clear here, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't think that there is any violation of insider trading law because this insider trading law do not apply for assets that are not regularly traded. It is as if I get to know in advance that the train will stop near that neighborhood, the house price on that neighborhood will go up and I buy on that information that's not necessarily inside the trading. And you can say that there is some value because the information is then reflected eventually in market prices. The problem is that the amount of reward here seems to be quite disproportionate for the benefit they bring. And it's particularly hurtful because the losers are not just the 
students who had the dinky TV station, the losers are all the taxpayers. The government could have easily raised 10 billion more in this auction. This was basically $10 billion of taxpayers' money that was literally pissed away. Yeah, and I think that's what makes this, you know, so compelling on one hand, but also, like, frustrating. Because people get pissed when funds are you know, misappropriated and misused by government officials. Like, if a, you know, if a senator is bribed, like, everyone's going to be up in arms and they're going to get angry about that. Even in the case of, you know, the Disney company, which we talked about a long time ago, um, even though at first some of the Disney licenses and, you know, monopoly rights went unnoticed, eventually a lot of people got really angry about it. And you still hear people complaining about Disney's rights today. But something like this, right, like the Spectrum auction, it's pretty esoteric, it's pretty obscure, and so you're not going to have regular people, like, complaining about this and writing letters to their senators and congressmen every day to prevent this sort of behavior from happening. And so it is sort of the taxpayers being robbed in a sneaky way that's not going to attract any attention. The problem is what role the economic profession play in this? Because we started with the economic profession being heroes, like Ronald Coase had this fantastic idea that changed the way we regulate the spectrum all over the world and raise an enormous amount of funds for taxpayers. So I think that that is uh, the success story. However, with it come a bias that most of us in the economic profession tend to have is that we focus only on or mostly on efficiency and not uh, distribution. Kate, can you explain to our listeners what is this idea of focusing mostly on efficiency and not distribution? No. <laughs> uh, I would put it differently, right? So I think economists like to focus on theory and theories don't always play out in terms of practical realities. I can see why economists are thinking about the best way to structure this auction. And they're like, you know what, it should be, it should involve these two different components. But they weren't thinking about the fact that private equity firms could just kind of sneak their way in and insert themselves into this auction process as a third component. And so even though in theory they may have been correct, they weren't really looking at the whole practical picture of how, you know, markets work. I think actually both stories can be true at the same time, and unfortunately they go in, in the same direction. And since when it comes to promoting this idea, the idea of this uh, reverse auction got huge endorsement by all the most famous economists. In April 2011, 112 economists, including several Nobel Prizes, sent a letter to President Obama advocating for the incentive auction. And all the awards were how efficient it is to use the market to reallocate these property rights very much in the cost theorem tradition. No trace, at least I could find of, of worry that in the process the government was leaving too much money on the table. Why? Because my interpretation, and you might disagree, Kate, my interpretation is we tend to focus on efficiency and uh, distribution is kind of second order. But sometimes it's not second order. Actually, maybe most of the time it's not second order. Yeah, so if distribution is just, you know, who ends up getting what at the end of the day, then you call it distribution, I call it, you know, practical reality, but I think we're arguing the same thing. And, uh, you know, I, true to uh, disclaimer, I'm not an expert on auctions, but I think that there was a very simple way to prevent this problem. The very simple way was to give to the government a right of first refusal for every transaction that uh, had taken place recently where the broadcaster was selling their licenses to third parties. So if I don't want to be too intrusive and force eminent domain application, force you to sell, at least I can come in and if I see the students selling a license for 1.8 million and I know that we're going to do the auction and we're going to value that much, much more. Why don't I have the right of first refusal and buy that auction? So that is one, one simple uh, requirement. The other is to not allow some players to have 
multiple licenses, especially financial players, because if you are a broadcaster, I can see why you want to have multiple channels at the same time. But if you are not a broadcaster, you're purely a financial player, I don't see why the FCC should authorize those sales. And my understanding, all those sales were filed with the FCC because you have to clear, uh, you have to, the FCC has to give the, uh, the authorization. So there was a simple way to stop it, and nobody thought of that. At least, not that we know. So... I agree with your simple ways, Luigi, but, you know, just to be the devil's advocate here, there are practical realities that make some of those simple ways more challenging. And one is that Congress and any sort of regulatory body, they just take a really long time, right? So the FCC first released this idea of the incentive auction, the national broadcasting plan in 2010, and it wasn't until like seven years later that the first auctions actually took place. And so you said, you know, you could just disqualify any transactions that had happened recently. But does recently encompass seven years ago? It's hard to really define that window. Actually, I, I don't think so, because since the moment the FCC published its plan in, in uh, 2010, it was pretty clear what the intention of the FCC were. The FCC could ask or could restrict transaction from that moment, knowing that eventually they will have this, uh, this intention. There is no sign, at least I don't see any sign, that uh, these concerns were even raised. Yeah, I think that's a good point, right? They could have held some sort of FCC review that said, you know, any transactions that take place after 2010 have to be approved by the FCC and they have to be operational transactions. They have to be like companies that really want to engage in operating TV broadcasting companies, not just private equity firms that are going to hold on to these licenses for five years. But this is where so the problem arises, in my view, is nobody has an interest in standing up for the taxpayers. If you really advocate very strongly for this, who are you going to benefit? Some hypothetical taxpayers that will never thank you. On the other hand, if you are at the very minimum silent on the topic, there are a lot of people who make a lot of money. They might be happy with you just because they made a lot of money. I think may maybe the thing we should mention is economists benefited by being advisor of everybody. They were a neutral party to that because at the end of the day, they got a lot of reputation, money and fame as a result of that. So they push it. In part, is also they, they benefited. We should also keep in mind that economists influence policy and they advise regulators, but they also work for hedge funds and private equity firms. And, you know, they have their own consulting companies. And in order to make sure, in order to ensure that there's nothing shady going on in the background, everyone should be very transparent about what sort of advising they're doing and who they're talking to. And I don't have any ax to grind with any of these people. Just that I think that uh, it's a bit strange the same people that write the letter to lobby, they are then advisors to the private equity firm that made the transaction. That connection is problematic. And when asked about this connection, at least one of them was completely flippant and say, oh, affiliation does not mean anything and uh, blah, blah. It was like not even recognized that there might be a problem here, which I think is, is the problem itself. If you don't think there is a problem, then we do have a problem. If you know that the, the, there is a, a potential problem and you take precaution, it's great. But if you don't uh, and you pretend there is none, I think that's a problem. That's my view. But, you know, something that stresses me out, Luigi, is that this is not just an issue with Spectrum, right? It's quite pervasive, this idea that the government, you know, controls the allocation of resources, it hands out licenses for certain sorts of resources. It allows some entrance into a market and not others. And every time that happens, you're kind of creating room for exploitation. And in some situations, you can institute a rule that says, you know, whoever's trying to exploit the system, they can't trade and they can't benefit from these government licenses. But most of the time, it's really hard to track them down. And as you said, there isn't much political appetite to really get into the weeds and prevent these things from happening. And so, you know, how can we come up with like a blanket rule that prevents situations like this? I don't think we can come up with a blanket rule, but I think what uh, the lesson here is that we have to be very 
careful when ideology, lobbying, and monetary incentives, they all go in the same direction. Because here, at least the way I read it, is we economists are all happy because we apply some uh, fundamental principle we believe very strongly, which is the market we allocate things properly. Okay, The people who are at the financial incentive, the private equity firms, don't care about the efficiency of the system. They care about making money. And so they find all this... Uh, Illusive economists who are willing to go out of their way to say this is the best way to, uh, to do it. And uh, they say, we don't care about whether the best way is. We make a lot of money. And by the way, we actually use some of these statements to push our agenda and get in the middle. That, unfortunately, happens more often than not. And uh, I think it's a very powerful uh, mix that creates a lot of the distortion we observe in the world today. Yeah, I agree that blanket solutions are probably hard to come by. But, you know, part of what really helps the situation, maybe not really helps, but helps somewhat, is to bring all of this to light. And we, we should try our best to reward the journalists and the blogs and the reporters who, like, dig through financial statements and uncover this information. Because it's hard to know, like, how Michael Dell's personal family trust fund actually makes money. But, you know, if you spend a lot of time chipping away at it, you might discover that they're just engaging in regulatory arbitrage and that information should be made public. Yeah, the problem is in this particular case, most of the broadcasters made money as well. So they want to be pretty silent. And so the reason why you don't see it anywhere except in some remote and obscure academic literature is because of that. Everybody uh, was invited to the table and everybody ate the taxpayer's lunch. Yeah. <laughs> this is interesting because at the same time is the best of capitalism and the worst of capitalism. The best of capitalism is the idea of using the price system to allocate resources in a way that is efficient. The problem is that uh, very often uh, when this is da not done with the proper rules, you end up redistributing resources to a few which at the cost of everybody else. And I think that that is the distortion that is fueled by uh, the lobbying, by the connection, that makes the system unfair and unappealing. I think that the government should have, and you know, maybe they already have this person, in which case, good for the government, but I think the government should have someone called the criminal mastermind general, who ought to work for a hedge fund or in private equity and make like a, a killing, but has the civic spirit where instead they just think of all the potential loopholes that can be exploited and then they make sure that they're closed from the government's perspective. I think, Kate, this is going to be your career. <laughs> After you become a lawyer, that's your perfect job. This is my dream job. Capital Isn't is a podcast from the University of Chicago Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review to Capital Isn't wherever you get your podcasts.